Good morning. Welcome to Convocation. Sorry we're a bit delayed, but thank you for waiting. I'd like to welcome you, all of you that are here, all of you that are in the class. Thank you for coming, and a special thank you to everybody in the community and from other classes that have come. I would just like to remind you, please turn your cell phones off. It would be very disruptive if you were making calls or receiving calls and texts, so please turn those off right now. I'd like to remind you of our upcoming convocations. Our last one of this semester next week will be our very own provost, Brad Cook. He will be speaking on what Islam has done for us, appreciating Islam's contribution to the world. That'll be next Tuesday, 11.30 in the auditorium, so don't forget that. And to introduce today's speaker, our very good friend of SUU, James Parkinson, will do the introduction. Thank you very much. It's an honor for me to be here today. It's always a pleasure to be on campus here at SUU, the home of the conference champions. I would like to thank uh, President Mike Benson and Provost uh, Brad Cook for allowing us to bring Mr. Hassan Jallo to campus. Uh, this is a remarkable program that you have here. You have wonderful speakers and you are not only entertained but you're educated. Today you're going to meet one of the foremost prosecutors in the world, Mr. Hassan Jallo. Mr. Jallo was born and raised in a small country in West Africa, the Gambia. It's probably the poorest country in Africa. He was able to educate himself he was the first member of his family to go to the university. He read law, became an attorney, became the Attorney General of the Gambia, then a Supreme Court Justice, then he went on to the United Nations. Today he's the Chief Prosecutor for the Rwanda Genocide in Arusha, Tanzania. As you know, in 1994, there was a horrific event that occurred in Rwanda. In 100 days, one million people were killed in a genocide. The United Nations, after peace was brought to that country, established a court and for the last uh, 10 years plus has been bringing the leaders of Rwanda to justice to answer and receive punishment for what they did. The man responsible for the entire prosecution for the billion-dollar-plus budget and the prosecutors, the investigation is Mr. Hassan Jallo. Those of you who have uh, read my book, Autodidactic, in the back I have an interview with Mr. Jallo about his experience uh, growing up and educating himself. And I put in the book that he was the most impressive man I'd ever met. They asked me the other day what, what it was for me to have him call me a brother and be part of his family. One of the reporters asked me that yesterday. And I said, knowing Hassan Jallo and associating with him and understanding who he is as a person has made me raise the standard and the bar in my life. And now I try to live up to the example that he has set. I give you Mr. Hassan Jallo. Good morning to all of you. Um, Mr. Provost, Professor Cook, faculty members, students, friends, gentlemen, I'm very honored and thankful for the invitation from the university to be a guest on this particular occasion and to share with you some reflections on the process of international criminal justice and more particularly, the work that we have been doing at the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda for the past decade and a half. I'm here with my colleague, Osman Jame, who is one of our 
attorneys at the International Criminal Tribunal. I'm also greatly indebted to my friends and family here in Utah, Sue and James Parkinson, who have introduced me to this magnificent state and with its magnificent people. It is indeed my second visit to Utah, and I do look forward to coming back. The 1990s were a bad time, a bad period for humanity. There was conflict in the Balkans, there were mass killings of civilians in the in former Yugoslavia, the Balkans. There were mass killings in Sierra Leone, in Liberia, in Cambodia. The conflict in the Balkans prompted the United Nations Security Council, acting under Chapter 7 of the United Nations Charter, to create the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. It prompted the United Nations to try a novel approach to dealing, to combating massive violations of human rights, that is the use of the international criminal justice process to bring to account those who played a leading role <clears throat> in these atrocities. The first time that the community indeed had tried anything similar was half a century earlier after the Second World War when the defeated Nazi leaders were arraigned before the International Military Tribunal uh, in Nuremberg. But in a way, the atrocities in the Balkans, in Sierra Leone, in Cambodia, almost pale into insignificance compared to what happened in Rwanda in 1994. The Rwandan genocide of 1994 surely ranks as one of the worst humanitarian tragedies of modern times. As James has mentioned to you, over a period of just 100 days from the evening of the 6th of April, more than one million Rwandans, men, women, and children, young and old, were slaughtered by a government and its armed forces, which were sworn to protect them, by extremists armed and encouraged by government officials, by their next door neighbors, as a matter of fact, who had cohabited them with them, but had abandoned the basic principle of being good neighbors. They were betrayed by doctors, doctors who betrayed their patients, teachers who betrayed their students, clergy who betrayed their flock, and led all of them to their death. The victims were basically overwhelmingly Tutsis and were slaughtered for no reason other than the fact that they happened to be Tutsis because their own government had stigmatized them over a period of time as bad people, as evil people, in the words of the then propaganda over the radio mill Colleen, as weed, bad weed, which had to be uprooted from the, from the farms if they were going to save their crops as cockroaches. They had been stigmatized as the source, source of all problems. But with them too died some members of the Hutu majority tribe, because even in those evil times, there were also good men who resisted. Good men who belonged to the majority, but who resisted, resisted the evil uh, intentions and plans uh, of the perpetrators. A worse fate bef befell the women folk within the Tutsi population. According to the United Nations report in 1994, more than 250,000 Tutsi women were subjected to sexual violence during those 100 days. They were sexually attacked, some were killed, but certainly all of them were scarred emotionally and physically for the rest of their lives. Targeting the women was deliberate, as it was seen as the most effective way of destroying the Tutsi population. And that destruction was indeed the objective of the genocide. The tragedy of the genocide was compounded by the, by the fact that there was ample warning of the impending catastrophe. There was enough evidence of the tragedy as it unfolded at the average rate of 10,000 civilians being killed every day for 100 days. 
But the world never found the unanimity, the consensus to intervene, to stop, to prevent, or to stop it. It took the courage and the determination of a small band of Rwandan refugees who had formed themselves into a rebel army to rescue the population and overthrow the government, a government which had been presiding over the destruction of a targeted section of its own population. There are several lessons to draw from the Rwandan genocide of 1994, some personal, some political. But one of these must surely be the importance of the principle of international good neighborliness and the imperative of global engagement for the protection and promotion of human rights and good governance for the principle of individual personal good neighborliness, for the principle that we should all be each other's keepers, no matter how distant we live from each other. An international community which has failed to prevent or indeed bring to end this tragedy responded as it did with the Balkan tragedy. It set up the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda in 1994 with the mandate to prosecute those who played a leading role in the genocide of 1994. The Rwanda Tribunal, that is our court, is based in Arusha, Tanzania, and is mandated by its statute to prosecute the crimes of genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity committed in Rwanda between the 1st of January 1994 and the 31st of December 1994 not only in Rwanda, but also similar offenses committed by Rwandan nationals in neighboring countries during the same period. That part of the mandate was made necessary by the fact that when the genocidal government and its forces were defeated, they all left Rwanda, or most of them left Rwanda, and entered the, democratic, the neighboring Democratic Republic of Congo after they had been defeated by the RPF. And of course, we know the difficulties that the Democratic Republic of Congo has been facing since 1994. The genociders and their supporters who fled Rwanda into DRC have continued their activities there since then, and every now and then, and particularly as highlighted in the recent mapping, violence mapping report issued by the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, there are incessant attacks on civilians and serious incidents of mass, large-scale sexual violence and looting. For the past decade and a half, we in, at the Arusha Tribunal have been engaged in bringing to account those people who played a leading role I've had the personal privilege of leading the investigations and the prosecutions as the chief prosecutor of the tribunal for the past seven years, building upon the foundations, solid foundations, laid down by my distinguished predecessors in the persons of George Goldstone of South Africa, George Louis Abo of Canada, and Carla Del Ponte of Switzerland, to all of whom we owe a debt of gratitude. Mass atrocities such as the genocide of 1994, they involve a large number of perpetrators, mass perpetrators, a large number of victims, and all this translates into large, into massive information evidence, providing serious challenges for trial management. The process of international criminal justice however, cannot prosecute all the perpetrators. There were hundreds of thousands of perpetrators in Rwanda. Our own system needs to reserve its mandate, given that it's an ad hoc process. It's going to close down soon. It must reserve its mandate for leading perpetrators whose prosecution has proved or may prove challenging for national legal systems. So Rwanda has been, for us, an effective partner in the process prosecuting the bulk of the, of the perpetrators in the traditional gachacha court system. So 
such, there were such a large scale number of perpetrators that no conventional legal system can actually process all those cases within a reasonable time. It would take decades to do that. So the Rwandans had to be innovative. They resurrected their traditional gachacha court, which means justice on the grass. It's a very informal system of justice administered by elders out in the public with the whole community participating, combining the need for legal justice as well as the process of conciliation in order to be able to deal with the cases in Rwanda. On our part, we have focused our attention on the leaders, as I said, and in this respect, we, in, we indicted 93 personalities for genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. Th that list includes high-level officials and members of the former government, from the prime minister who presided over the government during the genocide, to other members of the, of the cabinet which planned and executed the genocide. It includes senior military officers, the heads of the armed forces, the heads of the police, senior local government administrators, members of the clergy, media people, as well as some ordinary civilians who had participated extensively in the atrocities. Media people particularly, because the media played a leading role in the genocide, particularly through the Radio Mill Colleen, the broadcast by the Radio Mill Colleen, which incited the general public, incited the, Tuts, the Hutu population to rise up and indeed gave directions on the radio to people as to where to go in order to find uh, Tutsis to kill. We have prosecuted some of the founders and managers of that radio and uh, secured convictions for four of them and they are now serving extensive terms of, uh, of imprisonment, long terms of imprisonment. Amongst them also are, member, are journalists of the print media uh, people who published messages of hatred and incitement uh, again, against Tutsis. All of the 93 whom we indicted, of course, had fled Rwanda. They had the means to flee, to flee Rwanda after the genocide. They were high-level influential.